All right. So welcome, everyone, and welcome to another evening of First Speaks at First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. Momentarily, uh, Eva will introduce our speaker for this evening, Beatrice Olivastri, the CEO of Friends of the Earth Canada, who will be speaking on our topic tonight, Plastics, Plastics Everywhere. I want to also mention that this evening is the kickoff to the Plastics Challenge uh, that we've had on our plate for a long time, long delayed by the pandemic, of course, and now it's spring, a pandemic is evening, it is easing, and hopefully we're getting on with this challenge. Um, uh, we'll follow our usual forum for those uh, new, to, uh, new to one of our discussions. Um, it will uh, start with a uh, talk by our speaker uh, and followed by uh, about 20 minutes uh, from around 7.40 to about 8 o'clock of uh, questions that you can pose in chat in which I will moderate and pose to our speaker. And after 8 o'clock, uh, a period of uh, unrecorded open discussion. This is recorded currently, as I think people who are joining by Zoom uh, are aware. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Eva, who will introduce Beatrice. Thank you. And thank you, Mike. Yeah, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Beatrice Olivastri. Uh, Beatrice, or B, as I think she prefers to be called, uh, is uh, currently the CEO of Friends of the Earth Canada. Uh, and she has spent more than 40 years as an environmentalist and 25 years leading Friends of the Earth Canada. Friends of the Earth Canada now works with 70 other uh, national Friends of the Earth groups around the world. B develops and oversees delivery of Friends of the Earth campaigns and legal action currently addressing environmental justice, biodiversity, and climate change, and it includes specific campaigns like Saving the Bees and, of course, work on plastic pollution. Before joining Friends of the Earth, uh, B worked for, with several international organizations on UN processes such as the Earth Summit, environmentally sound technology, and citizen action. So she's really um, very knowledgeable and well positioned to speak to us tonight about plastics. And I think we're not going to like hearing some of the, the stuff that she's going to be sharing with us tonight, because I think we all know plastics are scary, and I think B is going to reinforce that. Um, but uh, she, this will be a great way to uh, introduction um, to our Spring Free from Plastics campaign. So thank you, B, for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Eva, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for everyone for making some time tonight to uh, come together. <clears throat> I seem to be on the verge of losing my voice all of a sudden, so you'll have to forgive me for croaking just a little bit and for drinking tea as I uh, talk, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I'm really glad that you're looking at a plastic campaign. <clears throat> I am very concerned that the campaign be about much more than recycling. And yes, you're not going to be very happy about some of the aspects of plastic pollution that I want to talk to you about. Um, you know, for a long time, we've placed plastic pollution in the same recycle bin, if you like, as recycling. Uh, and yet plastic pollution is far more pervasive. If we we're in a room together, I would be asking people to put up their hands and whatever, if you think the biggest issue of plastic pollution is marine pollution. And if you did, I wouldn't be surprised because a great deal of the exposure we've had is about the impact of marine pollution, so plastic pollution in the seas and the oceans on wildlife. Some of the images of uh, the albatross is the one, <clears throat> pardon me, that sticks with me, which is, you know, a dead bird that's basically been opened up and you can see the full body cavity just stuffed with plastic pollution. However, what I want to talk to you about tonight is more insidious than that. It's all the places that we are exposed as humans to plastic pollution, all the kinds of um, pathways in which our activities with plastic then 
shares the plastic pollution with the wider environment and comes back to us. So we're looking at something far more insidious than the kind of concern we might have about uh, plastic and recycling. Um, so I'd like to start my presentation visually with, um, let me go, can get a full screen on that. Okay. Are people seeing a full screen of this? Probably going to look a bit small if you don't have a full screen. It should be full screen now. Okay. You see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the image of a tap way up there in the air full of plastic pollution that was used, it was installed just a few weeks ago in Nairobi during the meeting of the UN Environment Assembly that was discussing for about the fourth time whether or not they would proceed with a new treaty on plastic and if so, with what level of, of um, um, exposure on the plastic side. So, this was an installation by a Canadian artist and an activist, and he's collected all of that pollution from the Kibera slums in Nairobi, which are the largest urban slums in all of Africa, some say the world, in fact. Um, but it's very emblematic because, as I'll tell you at, towards the end of my presentation, the treaty, the treaty is yet to come, but the resolution was agreed to move forward for the next two years to negotiate. And for the first time, they're talking about human rights and the, and the concerns about people who are the rag pickers, the people who are exposed on a daily basis to the contaminated plastic countries like ours send to the slums, to Southeast Asia and so forth. Anyway, so that's the first slide. Second slide, we can move on. It's just an overview to tell you what I'm going to cover after discussions with both Sherry and Eva. So we're going to talk about the harmful effects of plastic at a high level, um, touch on the plans of the fossil fuel industry to ramp up plastic production. I'm going to touch on also some of the trade aspects of um, plastic waste. And we have a longstanding history, unfortunately, I don't think we're doing all that much better either, but we'll touch on that. And then we'll talk about the action um, taking place in Canada on single use plastics as a step towards a lot more work in this area and the new resolution that leads to, I hope, a legally binding treaty. So we'll go to the next slide now. Okay, everybody put your glasses on or whatever you need. I'm sorry, this is tiny, tiny material. What I want to talk about is what microplastics are and some of the areas of concern, health concerns with respect to them. Um, if anyone's done any thinking or work on pesticides lately, this, it's, this is a very similar process I'm finding where things we've regarded as benign for many, many years, all of a sudden we start to hear the word inflammation, we start to hear about exposure and all of a sudden we're thinking more about the impact of whether, as I said, pesticides, but in this case, microplastics are in fact harmful to us as humans. We should be taking responsibility for the creation of these microplastics. And you could say <clears throat> we, in, we are responsible therefore for the fact that they're in the environment and coming full circle to have an impact on us. So, in case you haven't yet heard about microplastics, they're less than five millimeters, pretty tiny, it's 0.2 inches, if you prefer that way to measure. And just as a general basket, microplastics, we throw in nanoscale plastics, teeny, teeny, teeny ones, which I'm sure in a few years we will be studying separately. But for the moment, it's all in the one basket of microplastics. In some cases, microplastics are designed for commercial use, they're called nurdles, which I always think is a funny word, but it's a way that plastic is produced and then shipped off for other uses, extrusion, what, whatever the manufacturer wants to use them for. And sometimes the nurdles escape. So there are rivers, there's around Hamilton, for example, for some reason they're shipping nurdles over to the States or from the States back to us. 
They find lots and lots of them in waterways. Um, but also microfibers um, would be, microplastic would be found as fibers in our synthetic clothes. And they'd be spun as microfibers into, let's say, like I have on fleecy. This is a cotton one, but this is a polyester or some kind of synthetic. And every time you wash it, it is shedding microfibers. And if you wash it with hotter water, it's shedding more. If you washing it with an agitator, um, a top loading machine is shedding more. And even the companies who make products from recycled plastic, which was a good thing to do, we all thought, are shedding those, those fabrics, those products are shedding every time we wash them. Um, so those are all the design for commercial use, but also micro, Plastics are when pieces break off of the larger plastic things that are out in the environment or somewhere where they degrade. Plastic does degrade over time. Often what it's happening first is breaking down into smaller pieces. So as I said, these five millimeter pieces. Um, so we find a number of ways that microplastics enter the environment. <clears throat> in this particular picture, as I said, it's very hard to read. And, I'm still learning how to deal with zoom and trifocal glasses, so you'll forgive me here. I end up seeing the top of my head for a minute. Um, this diagram, which I'm not going to read to you, but you can absorb as you're looking at it, it's talking about on the left hand side the, the different ways we are absorbing or um, microplastics are coming into our bodies, inhalation, ingestion, and then on um, skin exposure, that would be more the nanoplastic. So you can see that on the left-hand side of the picture. Um, some people equate this to a credit card worth of plastic every month. I'm not sure that's an accurate measure, but in, in this schematic, they're showing a number of particles, which really doesn't mean anything to me, except it's a lot. On the right-hand side, it's talking about the, um, the way that we're absorbing it from airborne um, microplastics. And if you're breathing through your mouth, you're probably absorbing more than if you're breathing through your nose. Um, and anyway, and it's going on to talk about where the particles would be deposited, um, some of the coarse particles, and they're accumulating in your liver and kidneys. And it, you've, they're being found in human stools. Now, I'm gonna just flip over to another list I have, which I don't have in front of you, just to give you kind of a rundown. Everybody uses a kind of shopping list. So here's a shopping list you don't want. Where we find microplastics, bottled water, tea bags. So not the tea, but the bag. In the beer, in the rain, in the atmospheric air, as measured in this case in a research piece from the French Pyrenees Mountains, which you might think would be clean and healthy up there. Sea breeze, a research paper where they caught the sea breeze in a cloud catcher. It looks very picturesque to me. But anyway, they end up with microplastic particles in human feces, as I just mentioned, um, in all kinds of salts. A research paper looked at 128 grams of salt from over five continents, microplastics. We heard just last year in the Arctic ice, other research showing it shows up microplastics in over 220 species that have ingested microplastics while in nature. And then the one that breaks my heart, the human placenta. So in the placenta, but also in the fetus, that was a small number used in a research paper by an Italian researcher, but it was like the, um, the worst of the list in terms of saying there's no sacred place left that is immune to plastic pollution. Now, this is exposure, but we don't know what it means. There's a lot more work to be done. And I used the pesticide analogy before where we think there's something benign in our lives and all of a sudden as the research ramps up we're starting to find there are effects. We do know that ingested microplastics may, so may cause inflammation in tissue, cellular proliferation, necrosis, and it may compromise immune cells. 
So that's all may, possible, maybe, lots of research needed. But this is 2022. And as lately as 2019, the World Health Organization did a major piece of work on plastic pollution and drinking water and said, no evidence of risk so far. I thought that was a very unscientific phrase, so far. Um, though they had increasingly found that the body excretes about 90% of ingested plastic, micro and nano plastic uh, via the feces. So barely three years later, we're starting, we've, we've been seeing research that's saying there, there are effects. We, we're not really sure of all the different things that, that may be um, uh, the effect of exposure to microplastics or nanoplastics, but uh, it's not like, I think the thing that we need to just hold on to as non-scientists, for those of you who are like myself, I'm a policy wonk, just spends a lot of time in science, um, what you want to hold on to is there are harmful effects. You want to do everything you can to minimize exposure. Nobody wants microplastic or nanoplastic in their body, in their womb, anywhere close to any of your family, not to mention pets and wildlife and so on. Okay, so we spent quite a bit of time in that slide. Let's go to the next one. This is one that is... Um, you know, you may, if you're interested in this, you may want to look at it in more detail after, sometime after this talk. But this one is talking about the health conditions that are recognized now as being linked to chemicals that are associated with plastic. So when you have, when you make plastic, when you get something that's plastic, there may well be additives, toxic additives to that plastic, um, such as plasticizers. Um, flame retardants would be something that we'd be familiar with as well. And so, this chart, another one as the first one was from the UN Environment Program, just at the end of the year when they published this work, um, is looking at quite a long list of reproductive health issues for adults, pregnancy outcome issues for children, for offspring. And then on the right-hand side, some of the disorders and concerns. So neurodevelopmental disorders, hormonal disorders, respiratory disease like asthma, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and uh, decreased antibody response to vaccines. Hmm. So again, I think these, these are the kinds of responses to, uh, to pollution that's entirely unnecessary that we need to take very seriously. There are many other reasons one might be dealing with some of these health conditions beyond your control, but we're looking at exposure in this case from microplastic. And I'm not saying that you personally can control everything you're exposed to because it's ubiquitous now in the environment, but being conscious, being aware of these issues and taking action at home and politically as I'll talk about at the end of my talk um, would be appropriate things to do now to reduce the severity of these kind of health conditions. I'll go to the next slide. I hope I'm not turning anybody's hair white with this, frightening you more than perhaps you already are on this issue. Um, so this slide is a uh, look at where you're going to be exposed to microplastics. Again, I'm not gonna read it to you. Uh, I wish it was bigger. But, um, you can find microplastics in the air and up on the left-hand part of the slide, it's showing, um, outdoor exposure at 75 particles and indoor and dining room. Much higher, 3000, because you're looking at exposure in a confined space with perhaps plastic coatings on your laminate or hardwood floor, which sheds over time. Uh, any kind of synthetic material, maybe the tablecloth, on and on and on, um, that you would encounter indoor. On the left hand, bottom part of the slide, you see microplastics in food, as I mentioned earlier. Beer, <laughs> I'm sure it's in wine too, by the way, but the research that we see the most of is about beer. <clears throat> Maybe that says something about the researcher's favorite drink. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, dust fallout. Again, um, it's, there's been some interesting work a few months ago from Australia where they were 
looking at the amount of dust in various households and how much plastic, microplastic, nanoplastic would be in it. And it was the first thing that I found that's truly motivating for doing more housework. I really don't like housework very much. I really don't like dusting, but now I'm an enthusiastic duster because your exposure to plastic pollution is much higher if you have, say, dust bunnies, um, or you know, a dusty house that might be from having your windows open and a lot of truck or bus traffic as well. Anyway, so you see the microplastics in food. Uh, we mentioned earlier a bit the toxic additives that are in plastic products. So this is showing you quite a wide range there. Um, and then on the right, bottom right there, you're, you're, um, you can read a list of the main categories of the additives. I think one thing I would just mention, um, so you're seeing a lot of this is in the uh, land-based environment. We haven't talked a lot about marine yet, but when we find the microplastics in the marine environment where they do end up, whether we're excreting them or they're moving and um, pulsing with rainfall um, through fields, for example, um, they act like, the microplastics act like hitchhikers. So let's say they're in the sediment of Hamilton Bay, the bay in Hamilton, which is full of a range of pollutants, including legacy pollutants like PCBs. So pollutants like that can hitchhike on um, the microplastics and become active again in, you know, after being in the sediment for some time. So again, lots more work being done on that, not not encouraging, but important to, um, to get the work done. So I haven't spent any time much, as you see, about wildlife. Um, certainly, we have lots of concerns about plastic in oceans and waterways, but I thought today we should focus on this, I guess, more recent uh, focus, which is on human health. Now, on the next slide, we're going to look at some of the pathways, the major pathways, um, bearing in mind that we're generating this plastic waste. It kind of reminds me of the climate change issues. You know, it took us a long time to accept or realize that we were the cause of climate change, of um, CO2 generation. So here we are again, human generated plastic waste. Now this one's in the marine environment. So you can see that we're not just talking about oceans, we're talking about rivers and streams and lakes. Again, as I mentioned, sediments down in the left-hand corner and from the agricultural soil, um, this has really caught my attention in the last year. So looking at plastic films, some of the textiles that are used instead of mulch that some of which are allowed to degrade in the field. Um, and the application of sewage sludge, which we've been concerned about for a long time because of heavy metals. Now we can add plastic, microplastic, to the reason we're concerned about farmers using which, what they might regard as a free, no cost kind of fertilizer um, from wastewater treatment, um, but replete now with um, plastic pollution as well as the heavy metals. The other thing I think, um, You've probably heard a little bit of a joke on my name when um, we mentioned that we work on the bee cause. We do a lot of work on pesticides, neonics in particular, which are coated on crop seeds like corn and so on and so on. Now we know that many of these coatings are plastic. So the plastic is used to encase the seed with the pesticide and then it is injected, high pressure injected into the soil to uh, when it's planted. So we're not only getting a pesticide that is persistent in the soil and toxic to bees and other pollinators, but we're adding to the soil's load of microplastic. It just gets worse every time I look at it. Um, rodent traffic is a very interesting and concerning source because in many studies, they're assessing the impact from um, the, uh, the wear on tires as the single largest source of microplastics. And even though I've seen that statistic many times in the last couple of years, I see very little work being done about addressing it. You know, it's kind of a big picture opportunity that needs big players at the table 
and I don't see it happening yet, but it's got to happen because it's, um, it's at the top of the list. Instead, we're dealing with, well, you know what we're dealing with, I'll talk about it later, straws and things like that. Yeah, important, but the single biggest one from tires, not touching it yet. Um, close to that, by the way, is cigarette butts. Also a politically difficult item to address. Besides saying, don't smoke, what else are you gonna to say to, <laughs> to people who smoke or to cigarette manufacturers about their cigarette butts ending up in sewers, ending up being eaten by fish and other marine creatures that think they're tasty food. Um, okay, you can see yourself. Then we have the sewers, the sewage and wastewater I've mentioned before, um, uh, liquids from landfill. So much of our plastics are still landfill. Um, very few, under 10% are actually recycled um, from cities, which will be the range of things we've talked about in terms of buildings and households. Um, and the single use products that we're talking about. So let's go to the next one, which is a little bit deeper dive into the agricultural practices. And I put this one in because I think it's very interesting, but it's also not where you really expect to see plastic pollution generated, at least wasn't at the top of my list. Roads and tires have been at the top of my list for a long time. Okay, so looking here at agriculture, intentional, which, refers to what I had mentioned before about mulches and so on, um, the biosolids that we mentioned, the wastewater, um, and so on. You can see the wind tunnels. And I just checked the time and I'm running out of time already. Okay, next slide. We're gonna talk very quickly about the fact that the fossil fuel industry is looking for a new place to put their feedstocks as the use of oil and gas is going to be ratcheted down. Even some cities now saying all new construction cannot use uh, oil and gas heating, must, have, must go to electric right away, electric cars and so on. So the fossil fuel companies are looking for the next place to sell their product on the assumption they can still extract it and produce it. Um, this is a slide from a very interesting group um, the uh, environmental, International Environmental Law Organization in the States. What it's, it's showing is the combination of plastic packaging, which is a huge amount of the plastic waste, um, and incinerators, incineration of it with what some countries use as energy recovery. But just to show from 2015 to 2050, what the likely growth is going to be in plastic production, if it's unchecked which I hope it will be now with the recent UN decision. Um, so it's, been, it's showing you, you know, under that line, some of the scenarios for what can happen if there's no growth in plastic production, that's the second line, uh, no growth in the ratio of waste incineration. And the best case is that bottom line that tails out to close to zero at 2050. Um, I have to say that's increasingly the optimistic line. The next slide, please, is looking at the industrial plastic consumption per capita. And the main thing about this is just to realize that developing countries um, are consuming about 36 um, kilograms per capita a year, and we're 2.5% higher. So each one of us, as an average, is using 2.5% higher plastic in our lives and lifestyles than anyone in a developing country. And plastic production has risen very high, as we know, in the last decade, but it's expected to double from this year to 2040. And if we don't put any changes in place by 2050, the plastic itself will account for about 20% of oil consumption. Again, that's on the basis that we're not making big changes, which I hope we are going to. Um, the next slide, you'll notice I'm motoring more quickly now, is uh, I want to just touch on export of plastic waste. <clears throat> it is still legal to export some waste under the Babel Convention, depending on what the waste is. Um, often our waste will go to the U.S. first because we have a side agreement with the U.S. We saw outside of the Basel Convention that allows us to send plastic waste 
Once it's in the States, though, we have no um, custody on it. We can't tell where it goes from there. Um, and that, that's a great deal of concern to us. Um, the hazardous kind of plastic waste, some of it still also can be exported, but it has to be under a prior informed consent agreement. So what I'm showing you here is just that the, um, this is Malaysia and it's showing in uh, December of the last year, quite a spike in styrene. And we still haven't figured out where it's coming from. I think it's somewhere in Ontario and Quebec. Um, and we, we don't know yet, we're going to find out whether in fact Malaysia has agreed to accept this. It's gone there. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of transparency still about waste exports. And that's something that we want to see more of because this tends to be both commercial and domestic kind of plastic waste that's being shipped to these countries. I'll go to the next slide, please. So this is the one that's showing um, a broader set of Asian countries. And you, you just get an idea from um, January 20, 19, 2020 to December of the past year, um, the range of countries to whom we ship plastic waste, presumably with their agreement. Although um, you can see China's rather small in comparison to other countries at this point. Okay, next one. What we're going to, um, just touch on here, I've mentioned some of this already. We have ratified and the Basel Convention and we have signed on to the latest amendment, and, but we have the special side agreement with the US. Um, so it's kind of hard to know where a fair amount of our plastic waste in fact ends up. Um, but anyway, this is simply laying out that there are two different baskets of waste that we export. And the second one, the hazardous one, requires agreement under the Basel Convention, but um, very few exporters seem to designate their waste as hazardous. So it's very murky and we're spending some time right now asking Environment Canada for some records so that we can verify what's going on and asking them, what are they doing on enforcement? And uh, we'll see what happens with that. We'll go to the next one. This one is dealing very quickly with um, some fairly current work in Canada as of 2020. The, uh, in um, October, Environment Canada <clears throat> uh, had its scientific assessment, science assessment of plastic pollution um, confirmed, confirming that plastic pollution is everywhere in the environment. Uh, so it lays out where, and that it's negatively impacting our environment. Now it hasn't said it's negatively impacting our health. You often see human health and the environment together under you know, different regulations and acts. But anyway, so there's enough of a science base there that they felt confident in July, 2021 in designating plastic manufactured items as toxic substances under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Very important decision, um, one that the plastic industry has taken exception to. They feel that it, um, it uh, makes their products sound um, questionable and so on. And so they formed a new coalition, uh, which has now sued Environment Canada under what's called a judicial review to challenge this designation. They, they don't want to have to sell their product as something that's considered a toxic substance. I, our assessment right now is Environment Canada is in a good place on this case. We certainly hope that there's, there's no um, issue, but we, we don't know if industry on this one will take it all the way to the Supreme Court because it is a very important designation. Nevertheless, with that in place, Environment Canada was then able to move forward with its first of many measures, the first being its proposed regulation to ban six particular products that are frequently seen in the environment, shorelines and other places, um, and for which it's very difficult to find um, replacement plastic. And so those are checkout bags. I'm sorry, what I meant to say is replacements for plastic. Okay, I didn't mean replacement plastic. So checkout bags, cutlery, food service wear, uh, ring carriers like you have on beer and pop and so on, um, stir sticks and straws. There will be an exception made for straws for uh, a, 
a community of, of people who have um, disabilities and find that the plastic straw is important for their, their use. Um, but the other exception that they put in this, we take exception to, and that's to allow manufacture for export of these same products. The same six we're going to ban in Canada. They're proposing to allow companies to still make them in Canada as long as they're being sold outside of the country. I just, I couldn't believe this when I saw it. And so we're taking exception to that. We're challenging that. Um, we had a petition, which in fact, if you're still interested, you can, uh, we're going to continue it. It was specifically for the consultation on this matter, but uh, we're going to build it further because this is going to be a really tough one with business. They want to be able to continue to sell this crap. And I use that term on purpose. Um, outside of the country, whether it's to the States or any other country. And we feel that if it's toxic for Canadians, it should be toxic for everybody else too. So some positive things, some strong forward motion, um, some other areas Environment Canada is addressing now on recycled content, recycling target, they're saying 90%, which is amazing since we're now at what, 9%. Um, and working with provinces on what they call extended user, extended producer responsibility to make the producer pay for, responsible for plastic waste, plastic packaging. Uh, so lots to do. Uh, we're excited that Environment Canada has taken these steps, but we're gonna to be tough on them in terms of some of the details that are um, important to challenge. Finally, on um, the global stage, just very, very exciting after four different meetings of the UN Environment Assembly on this one, they got it together and they passed the kind of resolution needed to, um, to have the means, both people and resources to develop a binding treaty. So they need this resolution first to empower the negotiators um, to put together something that would be on ending plastic pollution. We were very concerned right up to the end that it would end up just dealing with called litter, marine litter. We really wanted to see something that would be um, the full life cycle of plastic and that's what we've got. So looking at its production, its design, its disposal, maybe not as strongly dealing with extraction as we would have liked, but the thing about these sort of efforts is first you need that resolution to start the work, then there's some room um, to further develop it. We're hoping to see it by 2024 and it would look at um, alternatives to what we're using now. It will look at what they call this um, circular economy. We have some issues with that still, even though it's widely endorsed by all kinds of major governments and industries but we think it misses the extraction part, which as I said earlier, is about what the fossil fuel industries have in mind, continuing the extraction for the feedstock needed for plastic. So the circular economy is a bit of an issue for us on this. Um, there may well be financial resources for lower income countries. And you know, a lot of people are describing this as something um, more important than anything else has been since um, 2015 with climate, but very much like the Montreal Protocol, which was, and still is, an incredibly important initiative that Canada led on, um, and that we still host the Secretariat for it in Montreal. So anyway, this is, I mean, in global environmental stuff, kind of the most exciting thing in a long time. And we're really very pleased that Canada supported this initiative and worked hard in the negotiations to bring together three different strands of resolutions into the one that was passed. I put a link there in case anybody wants to have a look at the resolution. It's just four pages long. Um, and it does address people in that it recognizes how important exposure is to um, the rag pickers and others who are dealing with our plastic that's being dumped in Asian countries. So the last slide is grim. This is what we don't want. What I want to ask you to do, you know, there's all kinds of things you've probably already thought about what you can do together, what you can do individually. And I think the most important thing is to take a bit of time to recognize plastic in your life, where it is, 
you know, we buy food, we do all kinds of things, not necessarily having the time or taking the time to recognize what the packaging is. Um, but then there's these other areas, as I've mentioned in households, the plastic on the flooring and these other places that we haven't really thought of for convenience. So we need to recognize where plastic is. We need to think about how number one, to refuse it in the first place. If we don't stop it at its source, all these other things we're going to do will never be enough to deal with the exposure issues that are only going to be more daunting as we learn more about them. We need to stop it at source, stop the packaging. We do see some important things changing in grocery stores. We need more of that. Last thing, I hope you will be small P political. And by that, I mean, I don't care who you vote for, but I hope you will let your member of parliament, your member of provincial parliament, and coming up this fall, your candidates for councillors and for the mayor know how important you think working on plastic pollution will be. And it's not just recycling. So much more than that, plastic, alternatives to plastic. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, B. That was a lot of information. Um, and 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 you're right. I think we'll we'll have us uh, even more conscious of the amount of plastics that that we're using. Um, we do have some questions, and I'll ask. Um, uh, just remind people that if you do have questions, just to put them in the chat to me, and I will pose them to B. We will have the opportunity for a more open question and answer service session. Um, after uh, eight o'clock. So um, one of our first questions is actually about organic food and uh, kind of commenting the discourage, how discouraged the person is um, that organic food is so often tightly wrapped up in plastics. So shouldn't organic, how do we deal with organic producers on this? Um. Well, I have a suggestion on that, which is there is an organic trade council that represents um, many of the organic food producers, all the way up from tiny to larger. Um, we deal with them on pesticide issues, but I, you know, I think it would be very interesting to talk to them about packaging issues. Um, there's a very strong association with plastic packaging of food and increased food waste as well. If all you can buy is four peppers because they're wrapped in plastic, for heaven's sakes, really just want one, um, you know, there's a likelihood of increased food waste. Um, so some supermarkets, for example, are taking the next step to make displays with single fruits and vegetables now. It's a little more work, they think. I think it looks nicer. Um, and there's been some work done to uh, a research paper I just saw last week that looked at whether or not the plastic packaging in fact does make it possible for the fruit and vegetable to be fresh longer, that's before date being longer. And in that study, it said no. So all that just to say, it's you, you hit a hot button there. I think we need to have the organic people kind of be consistent with the good that they're trying to do with what they've grown. I know, to me, it always seems ironic to be buying organic food and then having it in plastics, right? Yeah. So um, another question for you. How does the risk of micro and nano particles from plastics compare with similar sized particles from more traditional materials like wood, paper, steel, aluminum, cotton, wool, et cetera? That's a great question. I'm not a scientist. so. I can look into the question if you like. I mean, on the surface, what I would say is, you know, you can ingest tiny particles from any of those things if you're somewhere where they're being generated. Whether they are more inflammatory or not remains to be seen because as I said, it's only now that the research is pretty firm on the fact there's an inflammatory response to microplastics, nanoplastics. Um, I can only think if you were, um, I don't know, cutting wood and you inhaled something, 
I don't know, did you actually breathe it into your lungs or not? But it's the size of the particle that's probably part of the issue. So I, I can't give you a satisfactory answer on that, but I'd be happy to come back, maybe send um, Eva an email that she can share. Thank you. And I guess part of it is just the sheer volume and ubiquitousness, if that's a word, of plastics, right? We probably have far greater exposure to plastics than to most other materials. So another question that sounds pretty scientific to me, so we'll see how you do with this one. How quickly do microplastics oxidize? No idea. Yeah, that's, um, but in terms of breaking down, we know it takes, it takes possibly even centuries for a lot of microplastics, for a lot of plastics well, to break down. I, I've seen various charts on degradation. <clears throat> um, and it, you know, it's a combination of things, how much sun exposure is there? They degrade much more quickly if they're in sun in a certain, um, you know, in the tropics, it'll be faster, uh, certain times of year, it'll be faster. So I, I'm not sure there are any particular schedules on this, but um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, that's beyond my, beyond my education. A question here about recycling, and you mentioned that we need to do far more than recycle, but how much variation is there in what happens to the plastic we put in our blue boxes when you compare across the country? Yeah, um, <clears throat> quite a lot of variation. Um, for one thing, there are less and less markets in Canada for the mixed plastics. You might see things like you know, the picking tables and things that are made out of the gray kind of or brown. Those are the mixed plastics for which there are limited uses because there are many different kinds of polymers. And um, so there's, there's some of that. So that's a reuse possibility. Um, it's getting tougher and tougher to ship this crap offshore. So that's like the mixed contaminated plastic. You know, when you put something in your blue box and you haven't washed it out, let's say particularly gooey mayonnaise jar can contaminate a load of plastic in that the plastic that is processed with it is considered contaminated by the mayonnaise. You really should be washing out the stuff you put in your blue box, by the way. Um, so the contaminated plastic is low, low value and hard to find a place to deal with it. Um, so different, different parts of the country are trying to do different things. Alberta is trying to set itself up as a recycling center, recycling capital for North America. Um, and they're looking at using some of the solid waste that at this point is going to landfill to try and convert into an ethylene product, which would be, um, I think it's Nova that's building a, new, a big plant in Alberta. So it's, you know, the, I, it's sort of in free fall in a way. Different provinces are doing different things and having a hard time with recycling. It's always kind of a principle that as you have more of the same commodity, the same plastic, let's say PET from PET from drink bottles, if you have a lot of that, you can build a market around it. If you have a bit of that and a bit of, you know, the plastic pouches and whatever. So if you don't have the quantity, it's harder to get a market that will pay you anything for it. And our recycling has been built on a marketplace approach, which is that we expect it to earn its way. Way back when we first started all the stuff with the blue boxes, we expected industry to put money into it. So that was what we're now calling extended producer responsibility. We're kind of moving back towards that if they're selling product with something, some packaging that needs to be recycled, we're expecting them to bear the cost. What that means is you and I end up paying for it though. So they're not gonna take it off of their profit margin. Anyway. Uh, so it's so interesting that one of the other questions about is about extended producer responsibility yeah. and asking where the provinces of Ontario is on that. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we have some extended producer responsibility programs for a long time in Ontario, like tires, um, motor oil, and um, paint, I guess now too, because they have to accept back the um, paint for recycling. But yeah, I, I guess I would like to say in Ontario, we'll wait until we see what happens at the provincial election in a few weeks. And then we'll be looking again at where everything is because a lot of the work that was done in the past has been um, uh, axed is one word, minimized is another. Um, so I, I can't tell you that I'm up to date on the latest extended um, producer responsibility in Ontario. I know Alberta is trying to do a lot more itself and that relates more to plastic than anything else. So yeah, that's about all I can say about it at the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one more quick question and then uh, we're gonna turn it over to Donna for our spring free from challenge and B, I hope it meets your expectations here. Um, and that last question is, uh, we heard you say that only 10% of plastics are being recycled. Are these mainly the plastic items with number one and number two? I said less than 10%. And I, I don't know the makeup of it. Okay. Yeah. Does BC not um, have a better system for managing their, um, the marketing, like the, the recycling. So they, they actually have a much higher rate, don't they, than 10%? Yeah. They, they have had a really robust system for some time, um, including the drinks sector, like always in packaging, a big part is the soft drink and the breweries and the wine and, you know, the, the, um, the full beverage collection. So they've, they've been very um, well developed in that for a long time. Um, I think what's happening, I, I don't know if other people notice this, maybe it's an age thing, but a lot of the plastic packaging now too for food are the pouches. I'm not sure people know if they are or aren't recyclable and they should be. There's also the, um, you know, the various drinks that are in the laminated paper and aluminum and plastic um, packages, which say recycled where facilities are available. So this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that federally they're going to try and address in upcoming regulations, which is like what I call the weasel words on labeling. So where facilities exist should not be acceptable. If you're selling that product with that packaging in a jurisdiction, you better have the recycling facility there or don't sell it. But that has to be enforced. So until now, we've kind of let those kind of things go. And um, Federally, this is an area that their the Environment Canada is planning to be uh, acting on. So we'll, we'll see. I think it would be very good if they would. Great. Well, thank you very much, B. Um, I think, as I said, I think you've given us a lot to think about and um, a lot of reasons, additional reasons why we need to be taking action on plastics. And um, I've certainly heard your message that we need to do more than recycle. Um, one thing I did not expect from your uh, presentation, that was motivation to do housework. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm all, I always need that motivation. So thank you for that as well. And we'll look forward uh, to having a bit more of a question, an open question and answer period in a few minutes. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Donna, who's going to talk about our Spring Free from Plastics campaign. So well, thank you, Eva, and, and thank you, B. That was most interesting. Um, really appreciate your input, and I'm hoping that we can all take a small step to awareness of how much plastics we have in our life and exactly what it does to control us. Um, anyway, if I can have my first slide. Okay. As, as Mike said, uh, this has been around a while, and those of you who were here just about exactly two years ago, uh, you may remember we had a big launch, the ch the, this challenge that was coming up, Spring Free from Plastics. We had announcements, much excitement. We had posters. 
uh, and then we got cancelled. Well, fair enough, it wasn't just us. But you know, um, I recently started back to choir at the church, and I walked into the washroom the first day we were back, and up on the po up on the bulletin board in the washroom, there was our poster uh, advertising spring free from plastics. It was like being in virtual reality. Um, I can take um, take our next poster. Uh, so we're now at the stage where daylight saving is once again started and the equinox is next Sunday, March the 20th, and we have a slightly edited version of what we had planned to do two years ago and tonight's the night that we're getting ready to go. Um, so you can see there is there are going to be six sections in our, our challenge. Um, the first thing we're going to do the first four days and we're, we're starting that tomorrow. Uh, is getting ready. Um, what does this mean? Many of us have stainless steel water bottles, reusable mugs, reusable shopping bags or bins, uh, net bags, even plastic bags, which we can use uh, for, for which we can reuse. There's been so much plastic coming out of, of COVID. Um, anybody who did any shopping ended up with piles of plastic bags. So some of those you could actually reuse. Um, Take the time, this time, our getting ready time and finding all of these things and put them in the place where you're going to use them, like in your backpack or in your car, um, so that when you go shopping, the things that you have to reuse are not all at home. So first of all, gather those together and put them where you need them. Um, and also this, this time is about getting motivated. We're probably really motivated after listening to B. Um, but there's a, there's a short introduction also in our uh, package, which can give you a little bit of incentive to join us for the challenge. If you follow the link in uh, last Friday's EUU or on the climate action page uh, under the environmental, under the environment act, enviro action, um, you can read about the introduction and the getting ready. This is going to be followed up then, you can see by one, week one, two, three, and four, four weeks of challenge. Um, and this is what we'll then fin finish up with a week looking at how we did, and we finish up on April 22nd, which is Earth Day. Um, links to each of these sections you can find in the EU in the climate page, each week they'll be there. And if you need to, those of you who need hard copies, um, can if they if you request them from us, we'll make sure you get them. Um, slide, please. So let's take a look. This is this is the week one challenge, and we're just going to look at this as an example. Um, for each of the four challenge weeks, there are going to be five individual challenges to attempt. Uh, you can see them here: one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, including this the final one will be a community action. And this community action will be linked to that week's Enviro advocacy. So each week you're going to have an Enviro advocacy to do which will, which will be a community kind of thing. Now, if we look at this one, the first week's challenge, um, number one is avoid using any single plastic bags. That would include both bags for produce and bags for carrying your groceries in, uh, or any store where, where you're shopping, where you get pl plastic bags. Um, so remember to bring your reusable bags, uh, shopping bags or bins or whatever you have that you're going to carry things in. And then um, you tick the column, which most closely describes how your week went for each challenge. So if you did really well, and you really rocked it, you can, you can check that one off. If you did a pretty, pretty well, there were a couple of things, you, you took a couple of plastic bags in that one. Um, you could, could check that one. If it was just a bit, well, once you took a bag with you, uh, you could maybe check that one. Or if it didn't happen at all, well, well better luck the next, in our next challenge. The second one you can see, um, again, shopping linked. Avoid fruits and vegetables wrapped or contained in plastic packaging. Bring your own mesh bags, or again, bring plastic bags that you reuse. Um, I don't know that that prevents the microplastics, which is a bad thing, but I guess it's better than throwing them in the landfill. Um, again, check what you've been able to do. This is a bit harder to do, I have found. 
um, there's really just a lot of stuff, particularly meat and, uh, uh, and some kinds of produce, which if you want them, it's really hard to get them without the plastic packaging. Um, the third one's avoiding all styrofoam. That's getting better. There aren't as many things in styrofoam, but they're still, they're still packed in, in plastic trays or clamshells. Um, if possible, you can buy meat, poultry, and fish from the meat counter and have it wrapped in paper, um, or some places will allow you to bring your own containers now too. Uh, the fourth one, buy in bulk and bring your own containers to fill. There are stores like Bulk Barn, Natural Food Pantry, Urban Spice, New Grocery, or some of the places that are all set up for you to bring your own containers, which you can weigh and re reuse. And then there's a link that can give you a whole bunch of other ideas on that in that area. Now, the community action this first week is going to be to ask your local grocer, either talk to them, email them, phone them, um, to do one or more of the following. Stop using single plastic, plastic shopping and produce bags. Um, a lot have, you can usually, you have to pay for them in a lot of stores now, um, but they still, they're still produce bags, which are plastic. Um, take back your plastic containers or other plastic waste uh, and have them, uh, to show them how much there is, uh, get rid of it. Um, I have heard of people who, um, have managed to uh, leave all of that plastic at the cash at the checkout. Um, I'm not sure that that's where the, the person who needs to deal with it, but there are ways. Um, contact suppliers to avoid plastic containers, as B was mentioning, the Organic Council is one group to contact. Um, to allow you to bring your own containers for meat, fish, poultry, or bulk prepared foods and have that set up. So that's our first week of challenge. I'm not gonna go through them all. That's just to show you what, uh, what, they're all going to be similar, but a different thing each week. Uh, and then after you finish that up, um, talk about the difficulties you've encountered that week and any innovative innovations or creative solutions that you found to deal with it. Okay, we look at the next one. Um, I should have on there, the four weeks, the four weeks, uh, Lisa, there should be a thing that shows the, yes, there. Um, yeah, so the, the next ones we're going to do will be plastic free kitchen, plastic free lifestyle, plastic free bathroom and laundry, and then how did you do? Okay, so thanks a lot, Lisa, if you can go back to the, uh, the one we were at before. The very final week, uh, the how did you do, we're going to take a look at uh, what were your greatest challenges overall in decreasing your plastic waste? Uh, what were the most innovative or creation solutions you found overall to decrease your plastic waste? Which of these challenges will you continue to use in your daily life? And other comments or stories you might wish to share with a group and hopefully um, all things being equal, we'll get together on Earth Day to see if we can share things, but we're waiting to see what, uh, what the re restrictions are at that point. In addition, uh, each week, we're going to put up two posters at the back, large posters, probably in the shape of water bottles, where people can um, use sticky tapes and put on, uh, write on them, what have been, what were the things you really rocked? And on the other hand, what were the things that you found really challenging um, and perhaps some solutions that you thought were good so that we can uh, encourage each other as we go along. Um, now, next uh, one. So this is, uh, this is going to be, I hope this is going to have a good uh, number of people who contribute to this. And uh, we will, I, oh, I didn't, didn't mention to you that the links to each of these sections will be found each week in the EUU and on the climate action page so that, that you will, will be able to link up every day. Now, tomorrow, the, tomorrow's the day then. We start the challenge, so join that challenge. Spring is coming and the days are getting longer. So let's spring free from plastics. Um, and there will be prizes. So thanks a lot. Great.
Um, thanks a lot, Donna, for all the work setting that up um, and then resetting it up um, two years later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's hope it's a charmer now after that time. And uh, thanks again to Beatrice, a great presentation, um, a lot to learn on that. And um, yeah, my, my preconceived ideas uh, took, took a big turn. Um, so with that, I'll, um, I'll just remind everybody that the Earth Speaks series is uh, uh, part of our initiative that goes with the uh, congregational focus on the climate crisis. Uh, which was set over two years ago. So the speaker series is one of our actions around that. And uh, the link was pretty clear this evening on uh, on plastics and GHG emissions, um, especially uh, if incineration gets involved. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll end the formal session. Thanks to all the helpers that help with the Zoom and uh, everybody who helped shepherd this along this evening. And thanks for joining us. And with that, uh, in a moment, we'll shut um, recording off and just go to uh, a freewheeling discussion. Uh, encourage everybody to turn their cameras on uh, if 